Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, there's nothing like being genuinely surprised in this business, and if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm assuming that you do, because you're listening to us right now, you can go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. You can find us basically uh, wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, it's all good. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over to our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there, that'd be great. Also, you can find us on the social media, as the kids call it. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates. And plus, we're on the TikTok just for uh, basically our own amusement, but please feel free to join in there, too. Uh, And finally, and I dare say this is the most important part, uh, please come by and pay us a visit over at In The Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, the moving image at large, really, because that's what we love to write about and talk about it, and we love it when you come and read about it. So please stop on by. On this one, we got a fun episode. Uh, we're talking about the new uh, TV series called Blood and Water, Fire and Ice. It's a, it's an eight-part, 30-minute drama procedural. There's, I don't think there's ever been a 30-minute drama procedural, but that's, so that makes it kind of cool in and of itself. But it is airing on Omni Television, beginning on, well, as of right now, every Sunday night. And it's the story of Anna G, who is the ambitious young daughter of a former real estate developer, uh, Ranji. And there, she's running a thriving casino and condo complex in Toronto. But uh, the casino's success isn't enough for her. Uh, Anna is planning to build a new 60-story condo, despite knowing how leveraged the company is. Uh, but when Anna's sister-in-law, Teresa, notices some shady activity at the casino, uh, all the suspicion points to a notorious money launderer named Norris Pang. Anna hires ex-cop Michelle Chang, now a private investigator, to, to thwart uh, Pang's efforts, but Michelle is distracted by her own agenda, and she's desperately looking for her long-lost daughter, Rebecca. Worlds collide when Pang ends up kidnapping Rebecca, holding her hostage and eventually ransoming her in an attempt to get Michelle and Anna to do his bidding, but not before he worms his way into Anna's casino and into her, and into her family's risky condo deal. Every scheme to stop Pang fails until Anna, Michelle, and Teresa realizes they all have to join forces and work together to capture Pang and rescue young Rebecca. I was... It's a Canadian production... And I was, you know, I will, I will be flat out honest. I was genuinely surprised how engaging it was. It's from Breakthrough Entertainment, and it is airing, like I said, on Omni Television uh, every Sunday, with a lot of reruns, so people can catch up. But it's, uh, it's a really incredibly entertaining show that I got a lot out of. It's well done. It was done on a shoestring budget as well, and we had the distinct pleasure of uh, talking with showrunner. Uh, Diane Bohem, just about uh, sort of the origins of the show. Uh, this is the third season. It started in Vancouver, but now it has shifted to Toronto. And sort of the challenges they face just getting up and running. And plus, uh, they had to do this right at the beginning of the lockdown as well, which made for even that much more challenges. But it's uh, it's really an interesting piece of work and uh, uh, a real fun watch on television. So I do recommend you go check it out. Uh, it, but uh, first, enjoy our talk with Diane because uh, it's a pretty good one. I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess just to kick it off, I just want to say congratulations on the show because I will shamefully admit I didn't know it existed. But after watching a few episodes, I'm like, I'm getting into this. I'm kind of digging it. Oh, thank you. That's lovely. We we um, you know, we labor on on a very small channel uh, that uh, is not the Hero Network at Rogers, and and I think it is hard for people to find us. But um, thank you for saying that. I, I really appreciate it. We uh, we might be small, but uh, we do care a lot about what we do. Can you walk me through sort of the origin of the story, and especially now the move to Toronto with sort of the narrative of it all? Sure. Well, um, the very first season was uh, the story of uh, a cop, a homicide cop named Joe Bradley, 
and she was played by Steph Song, and that was obviously set in Vancouver. And it was kind of inspired by um, a very dear friend of mine who I grew up with, who was adopted. And she had a hard time as she got older. Um, she, she really, even though her family loved her and, and cared for her and she cared for them, she really didn't settle in very well, not knowing who her real family was. Mm -hmm. And um, I started to get to know a couple of people who had been through similar circumstances from China and were raising kids from China, um, mostly girls. And I started to wonder, what would that be like, uh, such a difficult emotional journey? And you were not only in um, a, a country that culturally and linguistically was very different from your own, but so far away, it, it might be so hard to be able to find your way back. My friend ultimately did, and it turned out not to be uh, she had a highly romanticized idea about how her family just wanted to meet her and all kinds of other stuff, and it, it didn't turn out that way. So uh, that sort of inspired Joe Bradley's journey, and we wrapped that around uh, the idea of how do we put that into a procedural by, by mixing her up with a family who was very proud of their cultural heritage and um, dismissive of people who uh, shared it but didn't. And the term in the Asian community for Chinese kids like that is bananas. Mm -hmm. So she was kind of a banana. And, and uh, she was a little bit of an insecure character and, and made her way through. But ultimately, uh, the second season, which Roger somehow doesn't seem to be making available online, I'm not sure. That's the season previous to this one, mm -hmm. was where Joe had gone at the end of season one. She goes to find her family. And then there's the fallout of what that is that happens in season two, of course, around the, the murder of the year. Um, with her, our co-star, who was Byron Mann, both of whom were wonderful. But at the end of that season, uh, our, our network felt like we had solved Joe's emotional journey about how she, you know, how she felt about her family, how she came to terms with who they were and what she was. And so, but they wanted to continue to do another season. And we recognized we had Dynamite in Selena, who is um, um, just completely... Um, amazing as an actor in that role. And even though she was our darkest character, I, I thought, why don't we take it and turn it on its head and be a mother's search for a daughter that she doesn't know? Yeah. And so that's sort of how the genesis of that became what you see in, in this current season. Well, and, um, I mean, fantastic. And I mean, I think the thing that was really standing out for me was just because, I mean, from the traditional North American sort of model of the procedural, it's an hour and there's different episodes and they're all kind of standalone. This was one arc. This felt very sort of British and UK and sort of giving us really one narrative and one arc just chopped up into multiple pieces. Can you talk to me a little bit about the decision of making them half hour episodes? Because we don't see the half hour procedural all that much. No, I don't think you see it at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we, back in 2014, uh, the executive at Omni, his name was Paratosh Mehta, who ordered the show. Um, he, I think in a way was, well, I mean, we have to be realistic and practical. You know, Blood and Water is not a high budget show. Even by Canadian standards, it's a low budget show. And um, he realized that his network was small and he didn't have a lot of resources and he didn't think that he could realistically fund one hours. And he was also trying to think about how narrative was being broken down and used, especially by younger audiences and especially by who he felt was his audience for this show. So in the Asian community, there's an awful lot of uh, early adopters. And right. so he thought, how can, we, how can we do something that is gonna be um, in easier to digest chunks where you can watch it on your phone, you can watch it on your commute, you can watch it while you're sitting in a doctor's office waiting for something. And, oh, and, uh, and so we came to the conclusion of let's try this half hour and I researched the hell out of it. And we hadn't, we didn't really find a lot of drama one hours at that time. Um, and it was 2014 when we started to shoot the first uh, season. So we kind of had to uh, just figure out what felt right for us. And also knowing we had budgetary limitations, we had to keep this very, very character based. So uh, we had a smaller uh, narrative structure because the half hour has fewer breaks. We had to write to those breaks, but we also knew we only had eight half hours, which kind of like a long movie in a way yeah so the number of acts had to be adjusted and the whole idea of how we structure the story and what the breaks were and we also didn't want it just to be we wanted to to give service to the other characters besides in the early seasons joe bradley and in this season um in this season it was uh, michelle chang but you know we kind of also you know you 
I don't know about how anybody else does things, but, but I tend to work very instinctively and um, realize when you've got something that you don't expect, which sometimes happens in comedies, um, and, and it came out in the talent of the people that we'd hired to play the Sia family. And they were all just so engaged. And, uh, you know, we, we developed a very, very good collaboration. And I thought, why wouldn't we want to see how the other side of this story is not just the procedural element, but it's, it's really, you know, I don't think about it as a procedural. It's a crime story. It's a family story, but it's very character based. And so the procedural elements are kind of just the triggers for what happens to the characters when they find out certain things. For sure. Now, I mean, a question it, or not? But no, it does. It, it does. No, for sure. And I mean, I love how really female driven the narrative is. And it, like, I think for me, like in watching, it, it's like it didn't feel forced. It didn't feel like it was trying to make a point that this was a female driven show. It just was a female driven show. And I mean, I think that felt so important. And Thank I'm kind of curious, like when you're assembling all this together, how do you sort of walk that line between sort of making something feel very natural and but at the same time wanting to sort of push forward the fact that this is a very strong female driven character driven show well we we i think you know you kind of develop a sixth sense about where to put your root now and what your strength is and i didn't you know there's certain things that i i was blessed with having great writers again we're a small budget show we didn't have a lot of writers with seniority we couldn't afford a writers guild show so everybody that we brought in was kind of emerging and still emerging in many cases they've gone on to do great things and it was it was sort of um when you get into a writer's room i don't know if you've ever done that or sat in on one but it's it can be a kind of anarchy in a really good way and uh there's a kind of chaos that happens when you give people free reign to go what where are we and you know what do we stick with and I was very, very adamant that this story wasn't, you know, not necessarily female centric, but obviously I'm female. So, you know, it's kind of where I naturally come from, but also I didn't want it to be American in the sense of okay. glamorization of violence, glamorization of sexuality. I, I didn't want to fall back on any of those tropes because they're tired, they're lazy. And I just, it's just something I'm, I'm quite strict about. And so we had a lot of young people who were like, we get that. And we tried some stuff and uh, some of it worked and some of it didn't. We learned along the way, you know, from the very beginning, we learned along the way. And uh, a lot of it was informed by just kind of a, you know, a balanced perspective that uh, I, I'm, I, I kind of like to be a little bit more of a Mike Lee or a Ken Loach kind of, and those are fi filmmakers and, you know, but in terms of how I like to collaborate with people. I love the reference. I love the referencing though. And I mean, I've got to imagine just for you as a storyteller, finding someone like Selena who really has a really has a distinct screen presence and very much a sense of the material had to be a gift from God. Can you talk to me a little bit just about sort of finding her? Yes, we we um when we went to create the character of Michelle Chang, that was for season two. Uh, we didn't, you know, we had, we had been, we'd done 16 episodes in the talent pool here in Canada. And we, we, we auditioned a lot of people and we just couldn't find someone who just had it. We just couldn't. So we started to cast the net wide and we worked with, um, we worked with a woman named Judy Lee in Vancouver and uh, Sharon Forrest here in Toronto. And ultimately we kind of put the word out. And so it was talking to people like Byron and, you know, who do you know? Who, who have you heard about? And um, Selena came to us that way. And she had been on a contract with TVB in Hong Kong for years. She's a Chinese Canadian, obviously. And, um, you know, she left here because she couldn't really find roles that were right for her. She didn't want to be, you know, third Chinese prostitute on the right. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, she is a very creatively demanding performer of her own talents. And she digs really, really deep for that. And so she typically, because when she was out as a contract player for TVB, it's like the old 50s when, you know, you would have been on a contract with MGM. You didn't have to audition for stuff. They just gave you stuff. Right. And she agreed to audition for us. And it was pretty much instantaneous. We saw her and went, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And it was it was uh, myself and my director, Felipe Rodriguez, who also directed the previous season. And we just looked at each other and we went we have to have this girl. She's just amazing. And it was just, it was just 
instantaneous, actually. And then, of course, once we had her, uh, and we realized as we went through the previous season how uh, how much she brought to the table. She asked a lot of questions. She developed a great rapport with Felipe, who is also, um, you know, very much has a filmmaker's mindset. And so it was just about kind of co-creating that character with her and listening to her when she said, I'm not sure how Michelle feels about this. And so when scripts started to come out and I was showing her stuff and she'd say, you know, yeah, I like this, but is there too much of that or a little bit more of that? And then we talk about it and I go, okay, I see where she's coming from. Let's see what I can do about that. So no, she's dynamite. She's just dynamite. And she just, I don't, how many episodes have you seen, Dave? Just the first two. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. They should send you links to all of them. <laughs> I, I, if you I, want them. I will ask for them. Absolutely. No, if you want them, um, uh, we have them, but they're very rough. They're not fit all finished. So some of them are rough, you know, they have temp track and they have, and they have, uh, you know, VFX needed and things like that. So they're not, they're, they're very rough. I don't know how you feel about watching those. No, that's but, no, that, I'll tell Nicole, I'd love to see the whole thing. But you know something, Selena, if you like what you saw in the first two, you just send me a little note after the eighth one. You got it. Because I, 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 you know, uh, well, I won't say anymore. I'll get Pam to send you some links. We'll get some links off to you. For sure. And, that'd, be, uh, that'd be fantastic. But, but you know, Selena just, I don't know. I, I mean, she got nominated in our, our CSAs for season two as Best Supporting Actor. And if she doesn't get nominated for Best Lead in this season, I'm going to make like Werner Herzog and eat my left shoe. <laughs> and if she doesn't win, I might eat both shoes. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I, she's just, she is completely, absolutely, and utterly um, captivating. But, you know, I mean, I can hear the in excitement in your voice just talking about sort of the working relationship between the two of you. And, I mean, people tend to take for granted that sort of finding the right person, especially to collaborate on stuff like this, doesn't always happen every day. No, no. And, and I think if I've learned anything in my years in this business, it's, uh, it's how to spot something and not to let it go because there are certain things that are just very special and you know, not everything is fully formed when you see that. I mean, I certainly felt that way about Simu Liu as well. Yeah. It was in our first season and, and came into our writing room for season two or the second half of season one, I should say. Um, you know, there's just, there's just a thing when you see it, you go, oh my God, how do we convince these people that they want to be with us? You know, it's <laughs> kind of that. But uh, yeah, she's great. She's awesome. Now, I mean, and this is, this is a silly question, but I always like to ask you, because, I mean, you're dropping so many film references. I've got to ask, like, thinking back into your life, was there, like, a moment or, like, a piece of work in your life that, that you think was the pivot point that got you into this business? Oh, yeah. You know what? That's a strange question. I'm going to answer it, and this is going to sound really weird. I'm a bit of a, a reading nerd. Do it. And, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a reading nerd. I'm a watching nerd. And when I was super young. Uh, we lived in the country, my family, we lived in the country. And once a week, we would go in to do grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. And my parents would drop me off at the library. And um, our little teeny library in our little teeny town happened to have in a book form, a screenplay for The Hustler. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, and I was, I read it, I didn't know what it was. I'd never read a screenplay before in my life, let alone, you know, and the movie was like, I had never seen the movie. I was way too young um, and it was way too old at that point in time, but I read it and was absolutely smitten. And I knew instantly I have to do this. I love that. I love that answer. That is so cool. Yeah. God knows where that is these days. God, I haven't thought about that in a million years. It's a really interesting question, Dave. Thank you for that. Well, and I mean, you know what, because I mean, in watching blood and water and fire and ice, I mean, it felt so cinematic and I mean, it felt really, it felt like event TV. And I mean, for something that happens on such a small budget, that's, that's a big thing to say. And I mean, I'm kind of curious, just from your perspective, as you, as these are coming out and God, you know, touch wood, you get to make more of them. What is the hope going forward? Because I mean, it's just feels like you've crafted a very sort of big and really sort of engaging world for audiences to sort of get up to get caught up in. Oh, thank you. No, you know, I, I can I can take a certain amount of credit for that, but to some degree, I'm just the hook it hangs on, you know, the, the, the hook that the code hangs on. And a, an enormous part of this, I don't want to minimize um, the fabulous collaboration that I have with Felipe, who is our director. 
and he is truly a filmmaker and he he's you know he's self-taught he came up through the ranks he's a, a movie nerd was a DOP and you know is an international Emmy nominated DOP for some of his documentary work and he thinks like a filmmaker and we have an amazing um, synergy that way and so you'll know you'll 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 kind of get some things if you watch it all the way through to eight I think because we both had a certain sort of aspiration about what this is and uh, you'll see some things as you get through it I think but uh, it, we very much wanted to make a and I'm using air quotes here uh, wanted to make a movie and not a TV series in the, in the conventional uh, Canadian sense where you know it, and and it's uh you know, and, and, and I, I was in broadcast for many years, so I, I kind of know what that looks like, but um, we had a rare opportunity here and um, we took it. So, well, thank you for taking it. And you know what? Don't sell yourself short because without that hook on the wall, the coat's lying on the floor, so. <laughs> oh, thank you. But, you know, I have to give Felipe credit because, you know, we, some of these low budget horror movies and stuff that are being made right now and these, these uh, lifetime movies and stuff, these romances, they're made in like 20, 21 days. Yeah. Um, and and we had 19 days. To, to um, shoot four hours of material? Wow, that's yeah. impressive. It was insane. And the second half of it, the, the last nine days, was uh, a year, 10 months, almost a year later. That's and, wild. Yeah, and then it was a question of having to go through and, you know, match up what we shot. Because in the first block, we shot everything in the casino. Right. And a couple of other scenes. So, you know, we shot all the casino stuff and then COVID hit. And so it was a question of how everything that we had uh, already booked, like literally that week where everything hit, we were supposed to shoot for the next two weeks. So it literally cut us in half. No. And we lost all of our locations that we had booked and art directed and Felipe had blocked and we had written for specific locations and we lost everything. And we couldn't get it back. It, you know, Selena was unavailable. Felipe was unavailable. I was unavailable. Paula Smith, our producer, was busy doing some other stuff. So we kind of had to wait primarily for Selena because we couldn't do it without her. Um, and, uh, and then in the meantime, I took some time because, you know, I like to stay in touch with my actors. And people like Oscar Sue and Fiona Fu, who have just marvelous, um, again, collaborative relationships. Like, guys, I'm wrestling with this. We're not going to be able to do a lot of hugging. We're not going to be able to do this. Yeah, we have yeah. to go to certain locations. Everything has to change. And, you know, they had come to me and said, Diana, I feel like in this block, my character's feeling a little light in the loafers. And it gave me a chance to catch my breath and go, you're right. And how do we give you, how do we give you more stuff? And how do we do that? So uh, it was basically a massive rewrite in between the and Yon to kind of figure out how we make those two pieces match up because I hope it's not perceptible to the to the viewer at home, but you know there are certain things and certain emotional triggers that were established in the casino that we had to respect. But the engine that drove them, that was supposed to drive them, had to be completely replaced with something else. Right. So um, it was, I, I you know it was it was I, I look at it as very much of a blessing in a strange way because I think catching our breath. I don't need to tell you, Dave, you know what it's like here. It's everywhere, not just Canada, but you get your money, go. So, Pretty much, yeah. And, and you got your money, wait. And it was a chance to go, oh, okay. Now that I have a, a pause here, um, what do I do with it? And how do I maximize? Because our resources shrunk even further because the additional costs that every show had to For absorb sure. because of COVID, you know, I mean, we were, we, we put everybody up in a hotel and kept our own little bubble for the last nine days because we were shooting last week of January and first week of February where we were in a stay at home lockdown order. Yeah. yeah. And everybody had to be tested every third day. And I mean, that stuff is like 250 bucks a test. So it was, it was a, a thing we had to adjust and calibrate to the best of our ability. And, you know, I, I I'm very fortunate that breakthrough was supportive and said, it's going to cost what it's going to cost. Uh, we want to finish it. We believe in you guys. We believe in the show. And uh, we have to keep people safe. So that was, um, yeah, I mean, it was tense. I won't say it's not tense, but it was, uh, it was a learning.
learning experience. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I mean, congratulations on the good work, obviously, in, in the face of some unique circumstances, because I mean, it's, it's really, it's really hooked me in as a viewer. And I mean, I can't wait to see the rest of it. And just congratulations on the work and keep doing the good work. And thank oh, you for the time today. You. Oh, you know what? It's a pleasure. And, and um, thanks for making time for me and, and our little show. And I'll make sure I don't, it might be a day or two that we can get some links to you. No fire. Again, just it's really about the performances and and kind of the story and, and where we go with it. Because when you talk about female energy, this this season is also very much about male power versus female power mm -hmm. and what that balance of power is and who takes charge and all of those things that are it's very much about that. And it's, I, I, I hope, I hope people, well, I, I don't want to be overt or preachy about any of that stuff, but I think even on an instinctive level, I hope people understand that it's, it's, it's kind of about that. I can't wait to see it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate this. And, and um, um, thanks again. I'll make sure we get you a link. Oh, that'd be fantastic. And thank you again for the time today. This was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Take care. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and and Blu-ray needs.